podcast where we focus on helping you claim what's rightfully yours, your health, and your freedom. We explore the three main areas of health, the physical realm, the biochemical realm, and the mental and emotional realm. We also explore all the areas of lifestyle we can find that will help you live more abundantly, regardless of where you're starting. And remember, in life, you'll either make excuses or create results. You choose. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Hant, and I'm glad to be with you here today. Make sure to head on down to the show notes and click on the link to join our tribe of human-powered life heroes, where we'll update you on new shows, events, product launches, and so much more. Now, it's time to enjoy the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Human Powered Life Podcast. We have an amazing guest today. We're gonna talk about food. We're gonna talk about being healthy, right? This is Dr. Pete Petitsis. Welcome, brother. Glad to have you here. Hey, Dr. Josh, thanks so much for having me. I'm I'm really excited to be here and uh, really passionate about the topic that we're gonna be exploring today. Yeah, you know, and I have just your, uh, on on the side of my screen here, I have uh, your website open and I have like, I'm getting hungry looking at it. So I don't even know what it is, but it's an avocado with something, some kind of maybe pesto or something. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just staring at it and getting hungry you know, it, here. It, so it sort of resonates with our theme of sort of plant-based protein, which I think is gaining traction, you know, worldwide, either by necessity or by design. But, um, you know, one of the big pillars of what we do is, is promote uh, the, you know, the consumption of plants and, and a lot of protein at that. And there's, there's a lot to be said about that source of protein too. So yeah, the website sort of highlights that. I thought it was a pretty yeah. colorful photo. Yeah, no, it's awesome. So let's, let's dive into your story. You know, you know, so many of us are the same in this natural health world, which also makes it easy to connect and it makes it easy for us to share our stories and our, our experience with other people. So give everybody, you know, you're a medical doctor. Yes. Um, have an MBA as well, or at least you probably spent way too much time in school. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, you're, you're in this natural health world, you know, when I see the letters MD, and I know you're, you're a practicing physician, you know, I'm thinking like the emergency medicine, all of these things, but you're kind of, you're connecting dots for people. So you're, you're there for their emergency care, right? Yes. Type of thing, but you're also there to help promote their health. So share your story with them. Yeah, I mean, uh, so much of my story is kind of existential. Um, you know, I kind of grew up with the idea that if you weren't happy every day at work, you you picked the wrong career path. And to some extent, I think there's a lot of value in finding um, sort of that sensation of happiness in the daily work that you do. But the reality is, is that a lot of nonprofit, exciting, meaningful work doesn't pay very well. And then at the same time, a lot of work that is not so meaningful pays very well. Uh, and, and then never mind the fact that sometimes when you hit that the, the ladder, um, you know, there's only so many lottery winners that that sort of, you know, that sort of make make much money at all. The reason I start out with that point is that to some extent for me, um, preventative medicine and um, lifestyle and holistic approach seem to be truly like a meaningful path to to wholeness, to wellness. Um, but at the same time, it was very difficult at least in the way that we have it structured in America to make a living out of. Um, and, you know, I think that's kind of by design. I mean, there's no reason why, um, why I in the emergency department should be able to charge a hundred dollars for a Tylenol, but, you know, someone who sits down with a, um, with a functional medicine doctor or, you know, just, um, let, let, let's call it just a physical therapist. Let's say that's that's bringing someone through an hour worth of therapy and talking with them and guiding them isn't paid a similar amount. So, you know, there's something in the system itself, I think that's incentivizing, um, you know, the wrong outcome and the wrong incentives for people to train and to get the right training that they need to help people the most. Um, so in, in any case, I, I grew up in central Pennsylvania and I've always had an interest in athletics since, since a kid, I was a pretty active soccer player, although I was benched constantly. It was, I, I became captain of my team, but it was purely based on charisma, nothing to do with skill. Uh, but what I, what I did see, though, was that that, um, that discipline and that exercise was very beneficial to me as a, as a youth. Uh, I eventually found myself playing rugby, and uh, I, I actually went on eventually to play for rugby's, um, the national team of Greece uh, and their rugby team, which I really enjoyed. So for all those uh, ruggers listening to the, 
to the podcast. I was a second row, a rugby player. And those guys do a lot of, you know, tackling and moving. But point is, is that, um, you know, I kind of found myself and all the while just seemed to have a really strong emphasis on my own health um, and really saw that blossom as I went through college and started to play more, um, you know, competitively. Um, at the same time, my father was an eye surgeon and uh, came from sort of that MD allopathic background. You know, he, he himself sort of had years where he had good health, years where he didn't have good health. I, I grew up eating all the wrong crap. I mean, it was a lot of trans fat, margarine and um, candies and white bread, et cetera. And so in, in a certain sense, medicine as a lifestyle it, through food didn't really become um, a sense of uh, a part of who I was till probably after college. And it was, I would say, a combination of like, like Netflix films, trying to be the biggest and baddest on the rugby field, um, <laughs> et cetera. And I found that a lot of the information I was getting was just kind of from, you know, social groups, Netflix films, and my own research, and not from, you know, the mainstream uh, community. My doctor, you know, growing up was, was frankly speaking, obese and you know, he was eating all the wrong stuff all day long as he saw patients. Not to say he wasn't doing good work. It's just that, you know, he wasn't, you know, you're not going to get information about preventative medicine from, from people I think that aren't, you know, walking the talk. Um, I bring this up just to say that, you know, there's, there's a lot of good information out there for those people motivated to find it. And I would say that in the last few years, especially, because uh, I finished college in 2007, um, for in the last years, especially, you know, now it's even more easy and we're more organized and coordinated and sophisticated online to, to keep each other all in check. Uh, you know, what's frustrating for me as a doctor, you know, just to kind of put it back on the patient for a second is a lot of people don't, you know, I'm going to repeat this again, they do not want to make the lifestyle changes, you know, and, and what I think is so exciting about the field of chiropractic or acupuncture or massage therapy, uh, physical therapy, even a lot of people who are showing up there kind of self-select and they self-filter themselves to be like very motivated, exciting people. And so I actually, before going to medical school, actually owned a chiropractic center. I, I worked out of uh, Belfont, Pennsylvania with a chiropractor. We had three massage therapists and acupuncturists. Um, and every once in a while, we, we'd sell, you know, some nutritional stuff too. But um, that was like my, my cup of tea. But it was very difficult in the central Pennsylvania healthcare climate to make a living doing that. But in, in general, though, it was like a super exciting place to work. Everyone was motivated. Everyone was excited. Um, we all kind of worked together to common goals. People lost weight. People got rid of chronic pain. I mean, it was great. But as soon as I kind of left that network of patients and people, it just seemed like the rest of the world wasn't really fundamentally interested in putting in the work it would take uh, to make lifestyle changes. And I found that very frustrating. Um, so, so in any case, I, I eventually went to medical school because I wanted to be on the other side of, of, uh, of the table. I didn't want to just be a business person in, in health and wellness. I wanted to be a doctor in it, um, really about patient care. And um, I thought that becoming a medical doctor would allow me to kind of be uh, respected across the, across the aisle, so to speak, to all those patients who weren't coming to my wellness center earlier, years earlier. And then I could speak to them on their level. What I found in the process of going through medical school was, again, that, that frustrating piece, which is a lot of people don't want um, to put in the work. And I'm, I'm not trying to say it's an easy thing. You know, I always found it interesting that like 30% of people that attend AA meetings actually stay sober. So, I mean, this food and alcohol and drugs, they're all very related in a certain sense. It's, it's actually the same pathway um, neurologically. And so... It's, it's an addiction. It's an addiction. And, and people are doing the best they can. But for me as a doc, I like to be in the emergency department helping people on, kind of instantaneously. And then in my own time, you know, like once I leave the office, so to speak, the emergency department, to be able to really put together a preventative medicine strategy with, with motivated people and slowly offer something to my own patients. So it's, it's kind of, um, you know, like I said, a, a lot of it sort of started with um, my interests, my background, uh, trying to get the best bang for my buck, and at the same time, trying to find meaningful work and also work that would that would allow me to live uh, a wonderful lifestyle. But heck, man, if, if I could just literally pick anything and, and, and make a good living at it, I'd probably be like a massage therapist. I mean, I would just, you know, I would <laughs> chat with people about their lives as I'm trying to work out their, you know, their, uh, their musculature and 
and you know just call it a day. But it's just not it's just not that the, the system is not set up in that way. Yeah, no, it's interesting. You know, in, in our practice in New York City, we we talk we have like we we as we go through care, if you will, with patients, initial care, we let them know there like there are options and 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 share, and they get to decide really how they want to play. And we talk about people that are very crisis motivated, which is the vast majority. Yeah. versus people that are lifestyle motivated, motivated, excuse yes. me. So we, in, in our practice, what's interesting is people start to go through our crisis care phase. It's, a, you know, you've probably heard of the term titration in chemistry, like yeah. dropping like the water and, you know, and for those who know what that means, if you remember being back in school, you're dropping like a clear liquid into another clear liquid and it eventually yeah. turns blue or green or red or whatever yeah, yeah. that, that magic, uh, right. Yeah. That color is. Yeah. So with titration and teaching people and encouraging people, empowering people, for the vast majority of our practice, and I think people that get exposed, like you said, to these healthier ways, if they're crisis motivated, with enough titration, they get it. Mm -hmm. And then they make the choice, okay, now I'm lifestyle motivated, I'm going to do the things that are good for me, I'm not going to do the things that I've always done, which have got me all the same results, which have put me in emergency rooms, which have put me like, you know, in surgeries or uh, yeah. chronically ill and sick all the time. So yeah, I think that's what you're doing. You're you're meeting people in a right in a place now of work, but you've also created this vast knowledge of nutrition and the history right behind a lot yeah, of the yeah. the nutrition, which is very cool to bring people in. And and I think you know, like you said, it's a lot of fun when we get into that lifestyle motivation versus no. There's nothing wrong with the crisis part of it. That they need that as yeah. well but most people only act on that part and then just wait for the next one to show up. Yeah. And it's, it's tough, right? Because we live in a, in a civilization that's just very foreign to tragedy and some of those sober realities. I mean, even, even, and again, I'm, I'm not trying to be political, but let's just say, let's just say that the most powerful man on earth is very old, like literally just too old. You know, I'm not going to be a hundred percent on all cylinders of that age. You know, we all have to have a certain sobriety to, the limitations of our human capacity. And I see that played out every day in the emergency department. For me, it motivates me to take my health very seriously because I see how frail it is. Mm -hmm. And, and, but for a lot of people, and, and I think that, that aren't in healthcare and not, you know, dealing with patients on a regular basis, you know, you can very easily ignore that and sort of like coast through life, kind of getting away with using, you know, escalators and subways and, you know, seeing your kids through zoom and not picking them up. And it's just, it's, we live in a very civilized society where mm -hmm. physicality can be completely ignored. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and as a result, you can get away with a lot and, and never kind of understand, oh, my gosh, you know, I, I'm huffing and puffing just like lifting up my, my 20 pound toddler, you know, like something's wrong, you know. Yeah, this is totally true. So let's fast forward. Now, now you're, you're practicing, you have become an author, you've studied up the wazoo as far as natural health goes, nutrition goes, the ethos diet. Um, can you describe a little bit about, you know, where did, where did that really come into play for you? Like, I yeah, want to write a book. Like, did you just wake up one morning and be like, you know, I'm going to write a book. Like, that's not sure. an easy thing to, to say know, I want to do. No, sure. Just like, just like many things, you know, it was part of um, an exploration of my own identity uh, to some extent too. So I'm, I'm Greek, uh, Greek American. I could get citizenship in Greece if I wanted, but I don't want to serve in the military. So I, uh, I'm just going to be a tourist until 40 and then I'll apply. Uh, which is which is just in like two years. But a point though is is that as a, a Greek and most likely Orthodox, if you had to roll the dice, you're, you're dealing with a Greek Orthodox Christian. Um, we have a very strong religious tradition that utilizes the practice of fasting, and it, it's pretty extreme by most measures. I mean, you know, if if I were to tell you that since seven I've been a you know vegan for half the year, a lot of people would be like, oh my god, you know, did you suffer as a child? Did you did you stunt your growth? Did you? I'm like, no way. No, I, I didn't. Uh, I didn't do any of that. And, and by the way, most people in, in the world don't have access to, you know, meat anyway, uh, on, on a daily basis, like we do in the US. So I just always find it funny that there, there's sort of like an ancient, um, let, let's call it an evolutionary uh, baseline, which is mm -hmm. like most most human beings are truly omnivores, almost by necessity. Um, and as, as a result, our bodies are, are made for both both um, both kinds of food. And um, so me sort of, you know, practicing fasting in this sort of vegan way, it's, it's not deprivation. It's, it's actually restoring me to a more natural state uh, with, that, with that seasonality of the food that I eat and consume. And so since seven, I've been doing that. But the problem was, is just like anything, as you, 
as you move away from sort of the, the, the core of the tradition, you, you start to water it down and lose it. So what I mean by that is I was following all the parameters of no meat, no dairy, but I was eating all the wrong crap. I mean, I was, I was seven through, like, like I said, that transformation during college years, trying to explore um, uh, nutrition and, and exercise. And I was eating trans, you know, trans fat that was in margarine. I was eating a lot of white bread, all the candy I wanted, like, oh, I'm fasting and following the rules, no big deal. And th there was some discipline in that because, you know, as a seven-year-old and all your, your friends bringing cupcakes, that, that can be difficult <laughs> to say yeah. no to. But um, at the same time, though, like I had this, this, this uh, capacity for discipline. I just need to use it in a more optimal way for my health. And, and so there's like 210 to maybe 300 million Orthodox Christians out there. And this book is kind of written um, like as a flagship in a certain sense for them to finally wake up and get return on investment for half a year's worth of fasting throughout the year where they become vegans. And as I, as I explored that in medical school, and I kind of knew, you know, where, where to look up literature research and how to read research in the first place, I started to, to find out that the, the par excellence of this tradition is in a region of Greece called Mount Athos, which is a community of 23 monasteries. And it's like Narnia, man. I've been there. I mean, it is literally <laughs> like stone castles, huge vistas, um, you know, no caution signs, no railings, you know, at your own risk. And, and people, people go there actually with an extra visa and permission from that, from the capital. It's the oldest surviving government in the world. Um, hmm. And, and it's, it's just like this little region of Greece that's, that like not many people know about. It is a UNESCO site. And if you can go online and like type in drone in Mount Athos, I mean, like I said, it is, it's, it's an adventurous, adventurous paradise. I mean, just beautiful green areas, castle-like structures, and people who look, frankly speaking, like Gandalf. I mean, it's like Lord of the Rings <laughs> <laughs> in real life. And so, so what's weird and fascinating is that this group of monasteries pride themselves um, by, by not interacting with the rest of the world. You have to come to them. But nevertheless, they have been outliving um, Greeks themselves who already have, you know, through the Mediterranean diet, a high life expectancy for, for centuries. Um, some of these monks um, have been living to 90s and 100 easily as they practice their ascetical practices. And the strongest practice that they utilize in their, in their day is one of fasting. And so as I teased out the practices of these monks where they intermittent fast, and I'll tell you why that's so mind-blowing, um, where they eat plant-based protein primarily and where they just walk they are living into ripe old age and are very lucid, um, have their health, very functional, and um, they live long, good lives. And um, in, you know, I'm sure like being at the top of a thousand foot cliff and breathing in fresh air and seeing the, the Mediterranean helps too. But, you know, it's, it really is a, a beautiful and mystical, mystical place, um, which is very foreign to our society. Because I think that a lot of things in the US are, are kind of the opposite spectrum. You know, we're very calculated, um, things are more functional on the side. Beauty is not the highest good. Um, this is a very different place. So as I started to look at what these monks were doing, and then I said, you know what, I'm going to get this 180 plus days of fasting for my own personal self in line. Like all the weight started to coming off. The, the energy increased. My sleep improved. Um, you know, I started to actually lose weight during the fasting periods instead of like actually kind of gaining it and feeling softer. <laughs> so so in any case, that, that self-exploration and trying to get good return on investment of what I was doing already kind of led me into doing medical research and literature research on this practice itself. And then I lived it. And once, once I lost like literally 35 pounds um, in 48 days a number of years ago, I knew I was onto something and I had, a, I had an opportunity to write like a, a thesis in medical school, excuse me. And I was like, you know what, I'm just going to spend the next six weeks, like just diving into the research. And so I probably put in, I don't know, probably 500 hours of, of research into, into this topic. And I didn't have time to do anything with in residency because I was a slave um, to, uh, to the emergency medicine system. But, you know, I, I, I learned a lot, but it was tough. And once I finished and became an attending, I was like, you know what, I'm, I got some time and I'm going to write a book and we're going to share with uh, my fellow comrades worldwide. But also, I think it's worthy to, to 
to push out to the rest of the, of the world because we need this so much, especially in America where obesity is so rampant and diabetes is so rampant. And that's how the, the office diet was created. Um, like I said, starting out with self-exploration, testing it out uh, with the literature and then testing out personally. And, and the hmm. book came after that. Hey, we're giving you a short break here where you can head down to the show notes or lifestylelocker.com and join our tribe of human-powered life heroes. You'll be the first to know about new shows, events, product launches, affiliate specials, and more. And now, back to the show. We couldn't quite validate it till recently in, in, you know, in terms of modern human history, but somehow cultures around the world picked up this practice of fasting and ran with it. And the reason that it, it, it stuck was because in reality, it is, it is a powerful tool for health, an incredible biohack. And there's many types of fasting. So one, um, because fasting is, like you said, it, it, there's a word there that sort of has a spectrum of definitions. Yeah. So in the most purest sense, you're absolutely right. It is no eating anything at all, period. And you might say that those people that do that, um, you know, popularly or are right now doing uh, fasting for Ramadan, you know, nothing to eat between sundown and sunset. And, um, you know, I, and I can't speak to the, to their full tradition, but basically it's, um, over a month of, of intermittent fasting practices, no food at all. I don't think they can drink water either. I don't think so either. Yeah. The, the other form of fasting is more just caloric deficit. Hey, I'm going to, um, I'm going to cut down on what I'm eating. I'm going to show a little bit more restraint. And then finally, um, it's, it's sort of food-based. I'm going to avoid, I'm going to eliminate um, certain types of food. And so, and then there's, there are various combinations of all three. But in, in the Greek Orthodox tradition, um, where, uh, you know, we've been, we've been doing this for, for quite a while, uh, you know, they, they practice fasting on Wednesdays, on Fridays, and then throughout the year, like seven weeks before Easter, six weeks or so before uh, Christmas, and several weeks here and there throughout the summer months. And so it's, it's sporadic and it's seasonal, which I think there's some wisdom in that. You know, it's, mm. you'll, you'll run yourself into the ground if you just were to do 180 days all, all in a row. Um, and so it has some uh, a cyc cyclicality to it. Yeah, so those, um, those Wednesdays, just to pause for a second, those Wednesday, Fridays, they're going throughout the year. Is that, is that like just, is that a, like we'll say a traditional fast, no food, no water, no nothing? Or is that you're switching from an omnivore to a, yeah. So, so what I would say is if, if you are asking me, what is, what is the setup uh, when I was a kid, I would tell you, oh, that means I don't eat any meat, any dairy, nothing with an ingredient with that. And I was like, that's it. Nothing, nothing else. You know, like that's all I have to do, mom and dad, you know, so can I please eat this, this piece of white bread and candy and whatever? And like, sure, son, you know, have as much as you like, you know, and feel good <laughs> about that. And, and then, you know, I'm a husky little kid, you know, running around trying to, trying to catch up with the rest of the kids. So that, that's what I would tell you then. What I've realized in the process of doing this literature review is that if you try to really do par excellence orthodox fasting, it includes plant-based protein and, and very um, unrefined, unprocessed foods. So kind of an elimination diet mm -hmm. in a sense. But then the second is you don't eat until three o'clock. Okay. You don't eat until three o'clock. And, and what I've uh, translated that into is, is intermittent fasting. I mean, yeah, what, you know, like three, 300 years ago, you said, oh, what are you doing? Uh, well, I'm, I'm doing the, you know, the Orthodox tradition of not eating till three o'clock. And that's what I do. But, you know, in the 21st century, we say no intermittent fasting. And so what ends up happening is these monks of Manathos only eat several hours a day. Um, and, and of course they don't call it intermittent fasting. They just, they just think it's, you know, uh, my, my religious practice. And there's certain, there's certain, poetic and beautiful reasons for that. But in any case, um, so what I, what I did then was say, hey, why don't I take this, you know, fasting practice where people are living longer as a result, bring it to modern human, uh, human civilization and, and, you know, promote it. And so what, what I have done personally, and, and this is what the Athos diet uh, encourages, is you don't eat, um, you don't eat for, for 16 to 20 hours a day, or we could say the opposite. You only eat for four to eight hours a day, four to eight hours a day. So you got the intermittent fasting part, which mimics this practice in Manathos. And then the second pillar is getting plant-based protein. Now, you know, the reality is, is you could probably do the diet um, with meat if you wanted to, and you just up the protein and lower your carbs, because there's, 
there's two, there's two parameters I said on that is I try to get people not to eat more than 140 grams of carbohydrate a day. And then they have to eat, they have to eat at least a hundred grams of protein a day, have as much fat as you want. So, you know, it's, there's sort of a ketosis aspect there. And we can talk about what that is if, if you like, but there's, there's this high protein aspect to the diet, but we prefer to get it through plants. And I think there's some historical reasons for that. And there's a lot of scientific uh, research for that. Did you ever watch the Netflix uh, document? Maybe it's not on Netflix, Amazon Prime, um, Game Changers. Uh -huh. Have you watched that? I mean, uh -huh. you know, th these guys, right where I thought I was pitying myself about performance and functionality, you watch this thing, you're like, wow, these, there's some pretty strong, fast people out there who are athletes mm -hmm. on a vegan diet and they're doing great. So in, in any case, I try to get these, uh, you know, my, my patients to, consume protein from a plant-based source. And then finally, I like to just remind people that, that walking is the best exercise out there overall for all ages, all demographics. It's kind of a universal, it's historic. And you know, you, you don't need necessarily to do CrossFit or, or marathons even, although you could. It's just that I like to reassure people that they don't have to overdo it. You know, They get their diet in place, they do something as simple as walking, they can do more, but if they at least do 30 minutes of walking a day, they have the Athos diet recipe and they optimize this, this quote unquote fasting pra uh, practice throughout the year. They lose a lot of weight and they get a lot of you know, physiological benefit from it. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll tell you just personally as, as an ultra marathoner, um, I, you know, we spoke about like being like a hunter gatherer, like an omnivore. Yes. That's, that's been my whole life, right? Like mm -hmm. brought up in the US, like that's just the way we ate. And as I started to, you know, I've read so many books on running on a lot of these like athletes that are like beyond uh, crazy, if you will, but very, yeah. very focused and very, uh, they can predict their results, like how they're going to feel after a hundred mile run or, you know, all of these things. And then I yeah. read a book and it was actually about I can't, something about heroes. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, yeah. It was written by the author of Born to Run. Okay. I think yes. Chris McDougal. And he talked about a lot of these, these Greek athletes that would, were eating like what, what in the US we would call a weed like in the yard, but they're so yes. nutrient dense. And all this. So I started to do all of this research and I became like during race season mm -hmm. from a month or two or three months out, depending on the, the type of run, I'll become like probably 90% plant or vegetable based. Yes. Uh, and and I, I can go to work on a Monday if I run a race on a 50 mile race on Sunday and nobody Incredible. would have any idea I ran 50 miles. Incredible. Yeah. You I know, I think that weed you're talking about is called Horta. In, in no, the, it's a, in, it might be that one. Is it or Perslane or something like that? Yeah, it, I'm, I'm not sure w actually what it actually is in the U.S. But if you go to any Greek restaurant in Greece, you can you can say I want some horta, and it's like the best fiber, very filling, yeah. lots of lemon. Okay. It's you know, it's it's basically a weed. I mean, it's it's the funniest yeah. thing. But it's like, yeah, give me all that, give me all that cut it, cut it, uh, weeds in your backyard there. You know, yeah, well, we we oh. actually we actually think of grow like growing, you know, planting some. It's called Perslane. Is like a, it's a very bitter. Hmm. Yes. Like weird, yes. but it's like, it's so nutrient dense. It's hmm. awesome. It's very slimy, weird if you blend it up, but it's uh, the flavor is like, I feel like a rule. It's awesome. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. Wow. Okay. So you, you came across, and this was in the practice of you being a part of this ultra marathon network of people. And yeah. And learning that, you know, a lot of these, some, so I listen some people do carnivore and do it. Right. Uh, yeah. But, but like, I, I found me personally when I would shift, primarily over to like whether it was like a greek or even like these mexican tribal people i would yes. eat those types of foods that are like ancient yes i would do it for long periods of time my my endurance was good i would shed weight which i probably will because i'm you know for me personally i'm heavy for ultra distance right mm -hmm. now but i will i shed weight when i do that like instantaneously it's i mean it's, it's all i'm sure it's all infl inflammation and other crap that's just stuck sure. in the system sure yeah, so. I mean, it's 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 interesting you bring that up. I mean, I think that um, you know, again, there's this there's this almost like test of, of time in these cultures where if you don't have the antibiotics and you don't have the cath lab and you don't have liposuction and surgery, what what can we do to keep ourselves in good health? And it just kind of makes sense that that you know, well, it doesn't make sense. It's just it's kind of suggested that yeah. through lifestyle and prevention we can get people to where they need to be so they don't ever need the medicines in the first place. I think the disconnect comes in the, in the US healthcare system is that, like I said, no one 
not no one wants, but we don't emphasize enough that this takes a lifestyle change, a cultural shift. And, um, and there needs to be some ritual around that, you know, yeah. some, some po- you know, po- poetry behind it, so to speak. Um, and, and that way we create a culture that's healthy. I mean, I, I think it's, it's crazy that in the U.S., the most, you know, we- arguably wealthy country in the world, um, with all of its technology and all of its convenience, has some of the sickest people in the world. Mm-hmm. And, and part of that is because we can get away with it, right? I mean, if we didn't have all the medications we had and all the surgeries we had and all the resources, we wouldn't be able to keep grandma and grandpa and mom and dad alive. I mean, literally, that you know. But at the same time, I don't understand why in our waiting rooms in the emergency department, where during COVID times people were waiting 24 hours in the ED, it was it was really it was really difficult um, this past winter, especially. But you know, why aren't we playing in our emergency departments like documentaries on prevention? You know, yeah. instead of like <laughs> just playing infomercials on BS like all hour long. And it's so funny because I've I've actually made these recommendations. I'm like, these these patients have nothing else to do except sit there and wait. Why don't we at least educate them, you know, yeah. in some meaningful way versus just playing yeah. my 600 pound life, you know, which is actually was was playing in one of the emergency departments I was in. And I don't I don't think the actually the goal of that show is to lose weight. I think they just show people. You that know, they can struggling. survive at 600 pounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's it just was such an irony. Like you're on the emergency department, people are dying and we're we're like glorifying this commercialized, you know, zero no, information. That, that, that makes show. so much sense. Oh my God, you know? But yeah. but again, people show up to the ED and it's too late. You know, the, the calculation has has been completed at that point. And I can't tell a diabetic at that point, like, hey, you're in diabetic ketoacidosis, you're, you know, you're hours away from probably going to a coma if we don't do something right now. However, once we get you stabilized, like by all means, let's get you on the right lifestyle for full health. But it's just, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, the urgency of that conversation is so, so extreme and we don't have, um, in, sorry, the, it's, so, it's such an urgent situation that we don't have the time to really yeah. break it down. Um, in the emergency department. So it's, it's a missed opportunity because that's when they're, mo- they're the most frail and perhaps most motivated to make a change. But mm-hmm. we, don't, we literally just don't have the time. We don't have the time to, to tell them about yeah. what's going on. Yeah, no, I have friends, family, uh, people that have had, you know, heart conditions and like, we'll say a heart attack or something, some kind of heart thing going on. It's, it could be life-threatening for the yeah. most part. And they'll, oh my God, thank God, you know, it's the emergency room, blah, blah, blah. They saved, they saved me. And then the first thing they want to do after is go get a slice of pizza or something. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Hold like time out. <laughs> like, hold on. Yeah. Really? Like, what do you, what, what's the thought process? You know? And it's, I think that you said like the, you know, we have such a deep connection to food uh, as a society all around the world. And, you know, we get addicted to certain things, obviously, you know, yeah. and I think that's what they call food science, right? Like <laughs> we have yes. right food science that, you know, we have this thing called the FDA in the U S it's like, we give you really bad food. Then we throw you on drugs for a lifetime. And we just get this, this never ending cycle. Yeah. It just keeps going on. So I, I urge everybody to definitely get this book. It's I'll tell you what, it's an easy book to go through. It's, it's simple. And you have, which is so cool in here. I'm just going to flip to it now. Um, you have like the plan, you know, and for those that are going to watch this, you'll see I'm just holding it yes. up. And it's like, literally you can take your pen or pencil and write in the book. Yes. And just go through your 48 days like, and just go through the process. And it's, I tell you what, if you track things, you can create success in your life, mm-hmm. whether it's business or losing five pounds or gaining five pounds of muscle, right? Like it's all trackable and it's all doable. If, and it's a lot easier if you know what the direction you're going in. Right, would you yeah, agree? We wanted, we wanted to make the book very actionable, you know, and just like kind of an emergency medicine, you know, it just, we, we just wanted people to, to read it, understand to the extent that they need to, to get to know that this is good science and then to just make, you know, start tomorrow yeah. and, and support them through that 48 days. Because in, in the process of the diet, you first and foremost, um, you know, it's such a paradigm shift. I mean, you're telling people you're not eating for most hours of the day, which is, which is completely opposite to our 24 seven culture, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah exactly. Can, we, we, we can shop every day of the week, every hour of the day. We can, you know, it's so constant. That's our culture. And that's, that is what we're undoing through this intermittent fasting practice, which is, which is a paradigm shift. 
And then second, you know, we're asking people to do plant-based, which again, in the US, it's kind of like, well, you know, plant-based, I mean, we're, you know, oh, we're, what about all the meat? You know, aren't, aren't, aren't we supposed to be as big, as bad as we can possibly be by eating all this steak? And, and the reality is, is that, you know, I'm not opposed to meat at all, but most of us are not going to be professional bodybuilders, NFL football players. This is a, those people are lottery winners, you know, not just from, for ability, but also free from some injuries. You know, it's, yeah. it's like so much goes into, I, I'd almost call it 99% work ethic and 1% destiny. It's not luck at all. It's like, it's like Providence that yeah. you end up on these teams, you know, um, and, and there are probably another thousand people that could have been on that team that got injured. Life just didn't go that way. Like they had all the abilities, but they just, it didn't work out. So I, I just try to say that to some extent, I feel like the U S has to stop marketing this like Nike culture of we're all going to be superstars and just be comfortable with being like a regional, like a regional guy, you know, like, like, you know, I, I, I compare myself like, oh, there's there's Dr. Pete, you know, he, he used to play rugby and he's he wasn't uh, in the World Cup, but he was a, he was he was a good athlete. You know, he was an attractive guy. His his wife thought he was attractive. His kids looked up to him like what's wrong with being um, a, a local hero. And I feel like to some extent in the U.S., we we elevate people to such a on such a platform. And there's like one guy you know, on, in that, on that stage when naturally, historically, you know, you grew up in a village and it was like, oh, he's the fastest guy in the town. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I want to be like him someday. Like we've robbed people of that regionality of, of feeling like they're successful. And I, I think one of the greatest documentaries ever watched was this film on Netflix called, uh, I think it's called That Guy from That Film. They, they followed these average actors through their, their careers and they show that like, I'm, I'm making up the numbers, but 250,000 registered actors, a hundred of them are known by the public. I mean, there's a lot of people who have amazing talent who never make it, you know, and they didn't do anything wrong, but you only have a hundred spots, you know? Yeah. And, and so, but really what those people should be doing is like celebrating their own local town, their skills, which I'm sure are excellent. And I don't know when last time it was, you went to a high school play, but you know, they're like Broadway films sometimes, you know, our, uh, our since kids high school, it's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, no, right. I mean, but, but at the same time, it's, it's, I, I think it's really unfortunate that we've by nature of, of being able to record a film and share it with the world through YouTube or through cinema, that we've eliminated this local celebration of talent. And, mm -hmm. and I think it does play into people's feelings of success. And, um, and it's, it's feeding the machine. I also think too, it's slightly exploitive uh, too, but Anyway, the reason I bring this all up is to say that the Athos diet, I think in, in certain parameters could be used for, for athletes of all shapes and forms, but it, it really is a, um, is a diet for the 21st century citizen who's just trying to be there for their kids, their grandkids, increase their longevity, increase their function, um, and just feel better. You know, I don't know if it's going to put you on the moon in terms of physiological success per se, but it, it definitely is going to lean you down, keep you in this world longer and get you off all your medications, which I think in terms of like daily reality is the goal. Yeah. I mean, I, I bet when like with all the people that you get to see in an emergency room, if you mention this and they're like, it's like, wait, I have to give up meat. And those same people are the same people that if they go and make food at home or go out to eat, they're like, I'll have two, two sides of potatoes. Avoid us. I won't get the vegetable. Like, you know, yeah, like they're that, yeah, that yeah. person, they like, they're opposed to actually eating vegetables. It's like starch and meat, which sure. is, you know, which is like, I would say is such like the huge piece of the problem is we become so used to like eat like easy, right? Like a steak is easy. Ground meat is easy. Cook, grilling a chicken. Is easy. But if I got to cut up a salad, I got to cut up a tomatoes. I got to cut up, all of this stuff. It's like, it's a, it's a job for people. And I think a lot of people, like, like the phones and like making videos, like we just said, like when it takes effort, it, it pushes people away because they're so used to just having instant access to whatever they want and including food. Sure. So sure. there is some instant gratification there. And, and it's also, you know, again, in our society through subsidies and many other factors, you know, the, the cheapest food out there is usually the most calorie dense, the most processed. But I mean, there is kind of a business case as, and I guess explore this in the book a little bit where, you know, why is it that 
a pint of blueberries is like, you know, so expensive relative to a pound of beef. Um, if people even cook it, I mean, I, I thought what was so interesting with COVID is that people actually had, you know, cause restaurants were closed, but you know, people had to start cooking food again. Um, but a lot of people eat out and they eat fast food and they, you know, they go out and, and those places design food in such a way through salt and fat and carbs, et cetera, that, you know, it's very addictive. I mean, if you try to eat Greek yogurt, you know, which is a healthy, which is a healthy option, just pure, no, nothing added on to it. I mean, you can't get to the bottom. But if you load on, you know, your favorite nuts, honey, sugar, whatever, I mean, you can just house down, house yeah. down that thing like it's nothing. Yeah. And so it's the combination of ingredients and, and macronutrients that makes things very addictive. Um, I only bring that up to say that, you know, it's p- part of part of this diet. And I think part of like the paleo diet, carnivore diet, you know, Michaela Peterson talking about her lion, um, lion diet. Um you know, a lot of these things are just harm reduction, like like elimination diets. I, I will say, as I as I see these debates between carnivore and vegan, and then everything in between, a lot of it is just fifty percent of the battle is just getting rid of processed foods. Like if you can just agree not to eat all that, you know, processed crap, you're, you're kind of already on the path to healing. But but then the next leap is is you know more refined and more sophisticated, and that's where the weeds get a little little thicker. But for, for me in the Athos diet, I mean, people are on it for 48 days and it's, it's all plant-based protein, but then I encourage them to, to basically seasonally and, and cyclically throughout the year, you know, eat, you know, bring that into their daily life, um, you know, as I, as I do, which is about 180 days a year. Yeah, that's great. I mean, so, so, so Dr. Pete, where the, where's the best place for people to find out more? Yeah. Um, I had the most, I had this great opportunity to make a, a little trailer about what, what the Athos diet is. It's online, but um, you can go online at www.theathosdiet.com, theathosdiet.com. And there's a great website there with, with podcast interviews. There's a blog on there. Um, and there's a trailer. Uh, it's like four minutes long that kind of summarizes in, in, in a very heartfelt way. Um, some of the action that, you know, that we're doing and, and uh, the philosophy behind the Athos diet. It's, it's pretty, uh, I think it's pretty powerful. Cool. Well, thank you so much. This has been a blast. Everybody, make sure you stick around, head over to the website, head over to lifestylelocker.com and you're going to get all the details in the show notes and you're going to catch the next segment with Dr. Pete. Thank you for tuning into this episode of the Human Powered Life Podcast. Make sure to head over to lifestylelocker.com to check out all the details on the show and to watch part two of this episode, which is only in video format. We also have this audio portion in video format if you want. Once again, I'm your host, Dr. Josh Hant for the Human Powered Life Podcast, and I'm looking forward to staying connected with you as a human powered life hero. Remember to join the tribe, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.